Hey, everyone. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Tuesday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. Could three weeks turn into four or five for LeBron James? That's next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcast. It's always free. It's never going to be behind a paywall. Locked On Lakers on YouTube is where you go to see the show and uh, join a community of Lakers fans, over 13,000 people strong. Thank you again to everyone for all the support to that channel, which is just growing faster than we really ever would have expected it to um and uh yeah so you interact with us there we interact with you as much as we possibly can we have some comments from uh, shows uh this week that we want to use for today's uh if if at all possible we'll get to it uh we want to talk about Paul gasol andy for today's show his number will be retired sent up to the rafters at the crypt um really cool yeah love pow um yep. so that that's going to be a discussion. By the way, we want to let everybody know Silver Screen and Rolls Harrison Fagan will be joining us after Tuesday night's game. So it'll make it even more fun to have Harrison on the show. Um, we'll get to Troy Brown Jr., who has been a topic of conversation, certainly on the YouTube chat boards um, and really across Lakers social media. But first, Andy, Shams, come on, man. How about some good news every once in a while? Shams has been nothing but a, a, a negative delivery man type thing <laughs> i had stronger words but i had to censor myself no i'm just gonna uh, let you keep talking <laughs> i i just i'm mad at him he keeps coming every time he opens his mouth about lebron or anybody else it's always like oh yeah and it's gonna be like this bad injury and it's, uh, it's gonna be two weeks now and so uh monday he's talking to, to folks and and is saying that um the three-week reevaluation period um, he he's sensing is just kind of a number that was put out there. The Lakers are, are certainly preparing for this to be longer than that could be four or whatever. And if you get too much longer, Andy, past three weeks, you know, you're pushing to the end of the season and even into a you know, potential play in game. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, this is what you and I had been bracing ourselves for and doing our best to brace the locked on Lakers community for, I mean, the, I, first of all, the idea that LeBron would get evaluated three weeks from the day of that news breaking and it all checking out and being able to play the next day after that three week calendar point struck us both as, you know, wish casting at best, stupid wish casting at worst. Um, the reality is you were most likely looking at four-ish weeks, pushing into five, you know, the idea that maybe you get a handful of games from LeBron before the play-in slash playoff moment begins for the Lakers, assuming it begins at all, and that also is undoubtedly going to play a role in the math and the calculus for all of this when it comes to LeBron getting back on the court. Yeah, there and, is and, at the very least, though, like you said, it's like you, you have to prepare for it. You have to be... You have to have a contingency plan. Look, maybe LeBron, this works out better. It heals up better. The pain tolerance, whatever it is, those, those check that checklist of things that can get him back on the floor. Um, but if you don't have a contingency plan that takes you through the end of the year, basically the last four or five, three, four, five games of the season, with the assumption that LeBron isn't out there, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, I mean, and frankly, you also have to have that realistic acknowledgement that depending on where the Lakers are, that is going to dictate whether or not they decide it is worth it for LeBron to go out there with this tendon injury at his age, with this sort of mileage, having dealt with ankle and foot issues all season, mm -hmm. you're going to weigh some, you know, cold, hard pragmatism into all of this. You know, as we've talked about before for the Lakers, this was going to be hard regardless and they had to treat this as it was going to be difficult, whether LeBron was going to be there or not. This was going to be a situation where AD, among you know everyone mostly, and this is something we're going to get into, most likely addressing a reader comment or a viewer comment on the YouTube channel, 
This was going to fall first and foremost on his shoulders, regardless of LeBron's availability. And then assuming D'Angelo Russell is back soon, and you know, my hope, my unsourced hope, is that the extra couple days off uh, between tonight's game versus Memphis and Friday's game versus the Raptors gives D'Lo enough time to be out there. But everybody was going to have to step this thing up because their margin for error was going to be really small with a without LeBron. It just becomes that much more difficult, but that much more of a challenge. They just have to embrace. Yeah, I mean, and for people, you know, there's still, um, you know, the the I guess the the hope is that D'Angelo Russell returns to the lineup soon. Darvin called him day to day uh, on Sunday ahead of the the Warriors game. He had been, you know, he had scrimmaged with the the stay ready group. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if it's not Tuesday, you do get, again, more days off in between. They do have the extra day. Um, and and the hope is at least by Friday. But let me, let me ask you this, because the way you phrased it, I wasn't sure exactly what you meant. If you, let's say LeBron is like reached that threshold and it's like, okay, I can give it a shot. It's It's painful, it hurts, it's whatever, but I can try it. Do you think, it, like, let's assuming there's something that they're still playing for, a chance to get into the play-in game? Do you think, like, do you think there's a, a chance that he wouldn't take the floor if he has an opportunity to, um, while the Lakers are still in contention for some kind of postseason, whatever you want to call it? No, I think if I, that's what I meant by. Okay, saying- I just want, I, I just want to double check because the way you phrased it, it almost sounded like you were saying that. You know, if they were, you know, really on the fringe, or if like LeBron was going to be, it was going to be, you know, hard for him to come back or whatever. I just, I, my my feeling was, if he could possibly come back and try to contribute to a game, even if it was at the very tail end of it, if they are mathematically alive, he will do it. I just don't, I I don't know if he'll be able to. Well, it depends. Look, some of the devil of this is in the details. I mean, it depends on how much of a risk. Is there for worsening this, you know, leaving him in a place where he can't begin next season because he's still recovering from an injury? Or even late- just as importantly, I don't mean to cut you off, but just as important to that is um, the ability to rehab this summer. Like you, right. you want to have as clean of a summer as possible so that you can go into the regular season without lingering stuff, without having to go yeah. slow. I mean, yeah, you, you know, so that make all, that does make a difference. That's all part of the cold, hard, pragmatic calculus that I was talking about before. Like, if the Lakers say with six games left in the season, in most most likely have to win six straight in order to give themselves like what is mathematically a ten percent chance of getting right. the ten seed. I think there is a chance that depending on where LeBron's foot is. And, you know, the the medical side of this, I'm not talking about pain tolerance. I'm not even talking about the ability to play through the pain and still be effective. I'm talking about potential risk. I, I think you do have to realistically weigh where you are and, you know, the idea of, okay, can, can LeBron exacerbate this? And if LeBron is going to end up missing the opening, you know, 10 to 15 games of next season. Right. Because to, he to, gets... to throw a Hail Mary this year. Right. No, I, like, that's I am not, not worth it. It's not. And I just wanted to make sure I understood because, like, I do think that, I mean, a lot of this and, and so much of this thing gets to, well, what can the Lakers do? And this is where it's intriguing because, and we'll break here in a second and get to Troy Brown, because... The, on the one hand, the schedule is favorable. It's about as favorable as the Lakers could possibly expect it to be in terms of uh, the opportunity to play teams in front of them, uh, the opportunity to play a couple lousy teams. You know, you get Houston, you know, and, and, and you know, you have Orlando on the schedule still. Like, it is not us just you know engaging in deep-seated homerism to sit here and talk about how the Lakers legitimately do have a chance to push this thing all the way through to the play-in even you know top six maybe not but you know top 10 somewhere sure even if LeBron can't play until you know the play-in portion of the playoffs begins like it's it's not crazy and part of the reason is because they are getting production out of people like Troy Brown And that is somebody that we would like to spend a few minutes talking about. We'll do it next. 
Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Built Bar. If you want an awesome tasting treat, but you don't want to deal with the fat and the calories, then you got to try Built Bar. You know, early spring is holiday season, and you're still carrying the extra weight and calories from the damage that you did Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah. And you got Easter, and you Kwanzaa. got Easter chocolate coming up Easter right coming around up. the corner, people. Exactly. Like holidays are just about gluttony and you want to work that off but at the same time you don't want to compromise taste because that's what makes eating fun that's why you got to try built bars built bars make healthy actually tasty they're great for trying to work off that holiday weight and they're covered in 100 real chocolate great flavors like churro peanut butter brownie coconut almond they taste deceptively like a candy bar but only 130 calories only four grams of sugar but 17 grams of protein. That's how you get yoked. And you don't have to wait around for a box. You can still use built.com as an option. Works great if you want to order, have them sent to you, but you can just be proactive. Go to your local Walmart, go to the pharmacy section, go to a Sam's Club. Just either way, find your box of assorted flavors and enjoy them. Uh, before we get to Troy Brown, so this from, uh, we mentioned, you know, you, you referenced the comment. Uh, Omar Morris uh, left the comment. You guys are putting everything on Anthony Davis. It's a team game and everyone has to play their roles to the fullest. That's how they will be successful. It seems like you guys have never played ball, but only give opinions of the game. Excuse me. I dominated the St. Gabriel Christmas tournament in eighth grade, Omar. So why don't you keep that opinion to yourself? Um, going back to Davis, if you remember, he was playing like an MVP with the Pelicans, yet never mounted to a championship. Stop putting all the burden on Davis. Um, but the thing about it is, we're not putting everything on Anthony Davis. It is obvious that other guys have to play well, too. Which Austin we said. Reeves. Yeah, Austin Reeves has to play well. And Malik Beasley has to play well. And they need D'Angelo Russell back. Like, everybody's got to step up a little bit. But the guy who has the, the ability to carry a team on this team is Anthony Davis. And he is far and away the most talented player that they have. And so if he doesn't play at an elite level, it's not that it's his fault or his sole responsibility, Andy, to win every game for the Lakers. It's that if Anthony Davis isn't playing at that elite level, they don't have enough talent to expect to win enough games to get to the playoffs. That's what we're talking about here. I'm just going to read the comment that I left in response to Omar on the Locked on Lakers YouTube uh, comment section and, you know, preface this by saying I appreciate Omar watching, appreciate him leaving the comment. We don't need to agree. But as I said to him, putting aside that we explicitly stated that the supporting cast stepping up was the difference between winning on Sunday and losing on Friday, because as we noted, Anthony Davis on Friday had 38 points. I think the next closest guy was 15, something like that. You're fooling yourself if you think AD is not the single biggest key to Lakers' success, whether this season or moving forward. Hell, Darvin Ham has said the same multiple times. LeBron is too old to carry more of a burden than he already does, and role players, while bearing a responsibility to carry their own weight, are role players for a reason. Anthony Davis is a superstar in his prime, and these are the responsibilities that come with such status. It goes without saying that other players will affect the season, but health assumed, no single factor will dictate the Lakers' success more than the level AD reaches. Anything else is just nonsense. AK. <laughs> just I mean, make sure he, you know, you, you, the people listening knew who it was. I'm sorry, from. but anything else really is just it nonsense. Is. It is, but and it, it's just th this, is, this is where they are. And um, we also, it's like they, he could play, he could have played that way on Sunday and the Lakers could have lost. Sure. But we wouldn't have been talking after the game that it was Anthony Davis's fault. So it's just no. it's just it's something to keep aware of that, you know, it's it's not necessarily each game is Anthony Davis's responsibility to win or lose. It's that each game he has to hit a certain bar or most likely, unless you get a very random, you know, Dennis Schroeder blows up on the same night as Malik Beasley. And they'll, they'll, they'll probably be a win or two, maybe, hopefully along the way, where AD doesn't have to be superhuman for them to win. But There was a game recently yeah. where the supporting cast, scoring-wise, carried LeBron and AD. Right. So it, these things can happen. It can but if you're happen. playing the odds, if you're but, playing the odds, 
It's on AD. It just Generally is. speaking, he has to hit a certain bar. He must be at least this to call give them to an opportunity. Yes, Correct. to give them an opportunity to win. One of the guys who has stepped up significantly, uh, certainly over the last you know couple of weeks, uh, feels a little longer than that. Troy Brown. Uh, looking at him just over his last 10 games, for example, Andy, he is, other than Austin Reeves, he's second on the team in true shooting uh, for anybody who is in the rotation in a meaningful way. He's shooting 46% from three-point range. He's playing, um, you know, generally touching, you know, getting close to 30 minutes a night, but a little over 26 on average, but those numbers have been creeping up. Um, and I think more than anybody on the team has sort of benefited from this reorganization of the rotation and the roster following the trade deadline. Like he just seems to fit in a way that is much better and playing a few games with large minutes in that nicely defined role. He, for me has become that guy where like, remember we were talking about with Lonnie Walker at the beginning of the year, like I wonder how they're going to pay Lonnie Walker. We want to keep him around. And then it was Thomas Bryant. It is officially, I wonder how they're going to keep Troy Brown around next year. Yeah, uh, one more number I wanted to point out. I was looking up like the last 15 games of Troy Brown, last nine games, nine being the marker of since the deadline Mm -hmm. with the new look roster, you know, three of these games without LeBron. He's been hitting 40-ish percent, whether you're talking about 15 games, nine games, not just uh, on threes, but above the break threes. Mm -hmm. And those have been the majority of his threes during that period. And that's really important because those are the harder threes. So if you can get other guys spacing out in the corner and have Troy Brown represent a legitimate above the break three and 40-ish percent above the break, that is legit. Oh yeah. That just that just plays another role in spacing out the offense, giving Anthony Davis more room, giving Dennis Schroeder the driving lanes, just making the most of this opportunity certainly without LeBron for a while, but we don't know when D'Angelo Russell is going to be back. Their playmaking is going to be suffering during this period. Like we talked about during Tuesday's show or Monday's show, there there really is only so many adjustments that Darvin Ham can make without LeBron and without D'Angelo Russell, like significant adjustments offensively. Maybe defensively you can try to do certain things, but offensively there's only so much you can do without your two best floor general, playmaker, ball handlers. Like, there are limits. So Troy Brown hitting not just his shots, but these type of shots, it's really important. You also, though, it's interesting you mentioned the idea of being able to pay Troy this offseason. And for people who don't know, the Lakers are only going to be able to pay Troy Brown a 120% raise coming off um, a veteran's minimum deal, a one-year deal that's a little bit under two mil. I double or, check, or they can give him one of their exceptions, right? But I'm talking about with their bird rights, just right. spe- but I'm glad you pointed that out, just specifically with bird rights. Um, that comes out to a little over four million dollars. I think Troy is playing at a level that is worth more than four million dollars around the NBA, particularly as a young player who could potentially grow into a role. Um, we'll see what ends up happening, but. One of the things I thought was interesting just with Troy and just larger picture, it really, I think, reinforces the importance of the options that Rob Palinka created at the deadline. Rob Palinka this year did about as well as you could realistically expect with your veterans minimums. Like Thomas Bryant, ultimately his role was going to go down and he wanted more of an opportunity, but he certainly played well. Schroeder has outplayed his contract. Troy Brown has outplayed his contract. You could even argue that unless unless the Lakers did not make a serious offer for Bruce Brown, and I've tried to find out, I've never been able to get an answer, but unless they did not make a serious offer out of economics, not wanting to commit to next offseason, Lonnie Walker may have been about the best they could have done for the mid-level heading into this year too. You can only expect so much with your veterans minimum guys popping big picture. Like they either – don't do much, or they're successful, and their success only matters if the team is performing really well. Yeah. Like it only matters if the team is winning. Otherwise, you're just looking at the next Malik Monk. Well, I think you know. Let's I, if you want to kind of look at this, like 
if he if he finishes the season up around 37 38 you know percent and he finishes the last what is it 15 games um playing 27 28 minutes a night which he probably will even when d'angelo is back like i don't think that's necessarily going to impact brown's minutes i mean no, moves he, guys he has, around it he has certain positionality other guys don't have right i mean it, it could a little bit i mean you would put a guy back in the lineup it makes a difference but Broadly speaking, you know, he's gonna he's in that 25 to 30 minute role. You know, if he ends up finishing the year around 38, 39% from three point range, continues to show, you know, put some good tape together in terms of passes you didn't expect Troy Brown to be able to make and uh, versatile defensive ability and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's gonna be hard to hold on to him. The, the one thing I do think helps maybe the Lakers, and I mentioned this on Twitter when I kind of put out this this idea of like he's he's moved into this space. Um is that he is kind of like he does he is one of those little things kind of guys. The the three and D thing becomes a little less quiet <laughs> the longer he keeps it up. But there is at least some hope that maybe the perception might be that he's just kind of more valuable to the Lakers than he is across the league. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're not talking about 12, 13, 14 million dollars a year for Troy Brown, but um, you know, we we had talked about the, the sort of the consensus around the league that somebody like Rui Hachimura could cost six, seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars a year to keep around. Troy Brown's outplayed Hachimura considerably over the last couple of weeks. So I would agree. If that's your benchmark, then you're looking at six, seven, eight, you know, whatever it might, you know, a mid level or something like that. Um, but I do love about this, and we'll get to Pow here next, is just it is a great reminder of how much context matters in pro sports. And look, Troy Brown is not... I think you got to at least see through the rest of the season before you say he's he's arrived, so to speak, or whatever. But he's a young player. Um, and context, particularly for young players, matters. And the context in Chicago, the context in Washington, the context where he fit in the rotation with the, lo- the roster the Lakers had at the beginning of the year versus the one that they'll have um, this offseason and potentially next. Or this season, you know, now and potentially next. It's the the mark of a good coaching staff. The mark of a good uh, front office is when you can find a guy and figure out who, who is a role player. Like we talked about earlier in the show, and figure out ways for that role player to maximize his strengths and hide his weaknesses. And if they could do that with Troy Brown, it would be really cool. Um, it, hopefully, they can do it in a way that allows them to keep him because uh, it would be nice if he finishes the season strong to actually hold on to him and keep some continuity. Pau Gasol is uh, one of, if not the uh, best guy that we've enjoyed covering over the time that we have spent with and around the Lakers. Uh, he is having his jersey retired Tuesday. It is going to be a really great event, and let's talk about it next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by FanDuel. We are in the home stretch of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That is a grand bonus bets back, even if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, really easy to use. And you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores or Three's drained, or you can get a little saucy with an exclusive bet like the two by three, two three pointers scored in the first three minutes. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your first no sweat first bet up to a thousand bucks in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. So uh, traditionally, the Lakers have uh, demanded a player be inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, before they get their jersey retired uh, at the arena. They have made exceptions before. They made one for Shaquille O'Neal uh, in an effort to, you know, the, the idea was actually at the time, I believe, that, that Dr. Buss would actually be, who yeah. was uh, ill, would be able to to live long enough to see it. It did not work out. Um, thank God they they made the exception with Kobe. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, Pau Gasol, who was a, a, an undeniable lock to get into the Hall of Fame this year, um, which he will do, uh, the Lakers went ahead and accelerated the clock there. So his jersey will get retired uh, tonight. This is, I, this is one of my favorite kind of moments for the Lakers because 
the quality of play, the quality of person, the, 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 what he represents about the quality of that era and the role he played in it, um, you know, in that, in the story of the Lakers, uh, of that time the you know, the, the Kobe pow, um, championship years, like he just, he represents everything that is kind of good about, uh, why people, like sports and like teams and, and, and get engaged with teams to me, at least he's an incredible player. And as you and I were really fortunate to learn being around that team on a day in day out, day out basis, incredible person. Mm -hmm. I mean, Powell is just, he's one of the best people we've been around, not just in sports, but just period. And, you know, we obviously saw this when he was a player and you would see, you know, a generousness on the court. You would know stories off the court, you know, his involvement with St. Jude's and different charities. And, you know, Powell had wanted to be a doctor before he realized he really could be a professional athlete, not just because Powell was- surgeon ever. Yeah. And, you know, it's not just because he's incredibly smart. I mean, he's one of the smartest people you will ever be around. Again, not athletes, people. But it's because Powell has an instinct to always help people. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this, you know, in the most tragic of circumstances after Kobe's death and the way Powell has taken it upon himself to help Shepard, Vanessa Bryant, and, you know, the other three daughters through this tragedy. I mean, you know, may we all have friends as great as Powell Gasol. Because, I mean, it just, this was something that he, he did not need to do at this level. And, you know, he had no obligation to do anything quite like this, but it's become really clear. He considers this something that is his responsibility. And I think also his joy to do. Yeah. And it's, this is one of the things that I think is, is highlight. Like, like, Pau Gasol is not being inducted into the hall of fame. He's not being, uh, has not having his Jersey retired because of anything I'm about to say. But it is, it, it is a unique burden that he really does in so many ways represent sort of and, and help carry Kobe's memory. It is, a, it is a strange thing that I don't think he, he is upset to do. Um, you, know, these are, you know, the family, Kobe, all these things were monumentally impactful for him and, 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 and family to him. But it, you understand what I'm saying? It's like it's a strange place where, like, he he now represents not just Pow and like his accomplishments on the court. I think to a lot of people, but he's this connection. I think with the Lakers to Kobe. I think he's a connection. For strange a lot of is fans. not the word I would use. I would use unique. I don't think it's strange. Strange implies an awkwardness or something about it that isn't fitting or it's not that it's not like fitting i just think it with a different person i think it could be uncomfortable i think it could be uh an unfair thing to kind of put on somebody or attach to someone obviously nobody would have ever asked for anything like this but it's one of those things that when i think about pow and why he is so significant to the organization it's now this 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 one more thing that is part of the the conversation. Like Dave McMenamin had a great story that was out on ESPN this week, talking about you know tonight and and Pow's connection still to the organization, his connection to the Bryants, and and all of that. It just it it drives home to me that this aspect of his post career career um, is. It, it's it's hard to describe what that is because of what Kobe is to this city, and you don't want you don't want to make Pow's night about Kobe, um, and you don't want to like. But I feel like he understands, and I hope I'm conveying this in a way that other people understand. I feel like he understands why that's important to people and why he is still part of that, and I feel like he's embraced that where other people might be more resistant because they feel like I am my own person here. I accomplished all of those things as well. I don't want 
attention, shine, whatever the right word is, removed. I, I, that's just not him. So much about the Pau Kobe relationship and on the court, off the court was perfect in so many ways. And I guess I feel like this tragic aspect of it is also perfect if somebody has to kind of carry it that way. Yeah. I mean, the reason I don't think it is a burden for Pau beyond the fact that he's just an inherently unselfish person is because I think he considers it an honor. You know, it's it's interesting too. Like I noticed this symmetry of how you know Powell's jersey is going to go next to Kobe's jerseys because just that's the order. Kobe's was Kobe's were the last retired. Powell's is next, but sixteen is this exact halfway point between eight and twenty four, and I think it's actually really cool that it's cool that you know he's in so many ways like this connection to Kobe and. Mm -hmm. You know, he was what helped in a lot of ways the second era of Kobe's career, the 24 era, get bridged so beautifully. But when, when you talked about, you know, how being, being a part of Kobe's memory and keeping that memory alive, I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, their partnership. And we've talked many times before about how Kobe and Powell were just so perfectly matched for each other. But I think Powell also brought out a side of Kobe that mattered as, as a mm -hmm. teammate. Like, I think Powell was the first teammate Kobe ever had that made him really realize the importance of reaching teammates as people. Like, he was starting to move a little bit in that direction because we were, you know, we were around the Kobe Shaq team a little bit, not enough that it really mattered, but enough that you could at least get an idea of the vibe. But we were certainly around basically everything post Shaq. And Kobe was moving a little bit in that direction, but I think he, I think he started to recognize like the need to show more of his own humanity in the process. If he was going to be a successful leader, and you know, Kobe would still drive guys. He could be relentless. He could frankly be mean at times, and often I'm not, mean to pal. Yeah, and look, Kobe was the first to admit, "I'm not for everyone." Like playing with me is not for everyone. He was the first to admit his competitiveness was not necessarily healthy for himself, much less those around him. But I think in a lot of ways, being teamed up with Pau, like as a player and as a person, underscored that importance of bringing out more of the humanity in himself. Because like when you see humanity at such a high level of Pau's and you see how people around him respond, you know, he had, had elements, I think of that with Lamar Odom, who another just incredibly good person and an exceptional teammate, just a great soul. But like Lamar didn't have the same level of accomplishment as Powell. Like there was not the same level of importance right. with Lamar as there was with Powell. And I, I think it makes you see a lot of things differently. And even for somebody like Kobe, when you're around somebody like Powell, for as much as the way people talk about Kobe changing Powell, and he did, he absolutely did. I think Pow changed Kobe too. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk a lot with Harrison, you know, about about Pow and and the ceremony tonight and all those things, um, you know, for 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 Wednesday's show. Um, but you know, this this conversation is an example of just how difficult it is now um, to 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 talk about Pow. Certainly, his NBA career, uh, you know, his international career, all that stuff is different. But even you know, even aspects of his international career are tied into Kobe. But um, how difficult it is to separate the two of them, um, particularly now. Um, but it is worth just a quick reminder as we go here, uh, just about how stunningly good a basketball player Powell was. Like you know, the the clips, just you know, the mixtapes you can go find of Powell, you know, with the Lakers when he was really in his prime, you know whipping passes behind his head on the break like that's my favorite one i think most fans know what that one is and like but just so skillful so skillful at a time when that 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 bridge between sort of the old school big man and today's sort of nikola Jokic kind of like pow was in a lot of ways you know the the, the thread between those things he was so skillful and the you know and footwork, both hands, this, that, whatever, great passer. Um, that it's just you know he is not in he is not in the Hall of Fame as a sidekick. He is in the Hall of Fame because he is truly one of the greatest players this game has ever seen. 
Yeah. I mean, his, his basketball IQ was up there with Kobe's. Mm-hmm. And that says something because Kobe is as smart a basketball player as I've ever a couple seen. Couple of Mensas right there. I mean, do you remember? I mean, the first time, the first game they played together, remember, it was on the road against the then New Jersey Nets. Mm-hmm. You would have thought they'd been together for five years, yeah. five minutes into their time together. Everybody was like, Oh wow, what a trick. Because people forget too, like, oh, Kobe forced no, the Lakers were in first place when they, you know, in the Western Conference. Andrew Bynum just got hurt, and everybody's like, Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Um, and all of a sudden, like, oh, but um, like you were like, hmm, this should work pretty well. Like, this wasn't one of those deals where everybody's like, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, he's a star, but I'm not sure this is gonna work and this and that, like. But everybody's like, wow, what a move. This this could be really good. And it took like five minutes where like, I think we underestimated what this could be. <laughs> <laughs> Holy. Mwah. Um anyway, more cursing. Let's we'll wrap it there. I could I couldn't think of a non-curse word when I was talking about shams at the beginning of the show. Couldn't think of a non-curse word now. So um anyway, more to come on POW after Tuesday's game. Uh again, we'll be back here with Harrison uh to talk about hopefully uh, a sneaky Lakers win. Uh, and certainly what will be a great night for everybody. You don't have to be that sneaky. Memphis isn't going to have John Morant. They're not going to have uh, Brandon Clark. Brandon Clark. They may not have Steven Adams. It may not actually be that sneaky. True. Just be bold about it, Lakers. All right, we'll see everybody Wednesday.